Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Amelia Vance, and I'm the Director of Youth and Education Privacy at the Future of Privacy Forum. We are absolutely thrilled uh, to be co-sponsoring this webinar with California IT in Education, formerly known as SETPA, uh, and Fagan, Friedman, and Full Frost. Uh, they are such great partners, and we are so thrilled to be able to present to you today on student privacy and safety in the context of distance learning during the COVID-19 pandemic. And so our overall host today is going to be Andrea. Good morning. Um, Hi, everyone. This is Andrea Bennett, Executive Director for SITE, California IT and Education. And um, I'll be uh, trying to take all the questions and um, uh, monitoring the, uh, the event with Amelia and Gretchen. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Andrea. Uh, Gretchen, do you want to briefly introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you all for having me. My name is Gretchen Shipley. I'm a partner at the law firm of Fagan Freeman Fullfrost, but many people just call us F3 Law. And we are a law firm dedicated to advising and representing school districts in California and throughout the country. And I chair our legal practice specifically dedicated to education technology. And I really look forward to helping you all through this challenging time and answering your questions you have today. Perfect. So Andrea, do you want to go through our agenda for today? Sure. So uh, just to clarify, we, um, we are talking about privacy today. We're, we're probably not going to have time to answer any technical questions um, or, or specific vendors. There's a lot of information here, so we're going to try to get through each of these questions here in about five minutes, and then we'll, we're going to have 15 minutes for uh, 10, 15 minutes for question and answer. So go ahead and use the question and answer and not the chat, if you can remember, um, to uh, ask your questions, and we'll line them up and we'll get them going. There's a lot of people monitoring this, so we should be good to go. Uh, first question. What are important steps you can take to establish a distance learning program during COVID-19? Perfect, and Gretchen. Okay, um, so just before I get into these 10 steps, I, I, I just wanna commend everyone on this call for your timeless work to provide continu continuity of education right now and establish distance learning. Since we are speaking to a nationwide audience, Many of you are at very different stages of transitioning to distance learning. So I'm, I'm quickly gonna walk through these 10 steps that both help you establish a distance learning plan and help you identify issues that you should be taking into consideration. Um, there's going to be many questions today and if we can't answer them all, I really encourage you all to continue to submit them to SITE and FPF and we can have future webinars to continue to answer your questions. But in the interest of time, I'm, I'm going to dive right in. So the overall theme is districts should be establishing a distance learning plan. These need to be flexible over time and varied for both short and long term goals. Please keep in mind that there needs to be equal access to education for all your students. And so you it may need to vary to make sure you are serving economically disadvantaged students, students with disabilities, and English language learners. Going through these 10 steps, uh, the first one is assess what resources you currently have, your hardware, your software, and what resources are needed to serve your student population in order to ultimately deliver online instruction, if that's your ultimate goal with your distance learning plan. I should give a caveat that distance learning could be a whole spectrum of options. On one end, the most focused and, and, and direct delivery method may be online instruction, live. Um, the other end of the spectrum, it could be even at the outset, giving paper packets to take home. So when I use the phrase distance learning, it could be a whole spectrum of those options. So again, step one, assess what you have. Step two, inquire it is legal and acceptable to inquire with your families what accessibility they have at home. Do they have devices? 
do they have connectivity to the internet? Um, I know in the state of California, which is likely throughout the country, um, we are obligated to provide our students with a free education, which means we cannot compel our families to purchase internet or to purchase devices. And so the district may have to expend resources to make sure there is that co connectivity at home. Um, and again, I wanna mention in providing equal access to your students, it doesn't necessarily mean it all has to be delivered through the same medium. If you have a variance of need and accessibility, as long as you're providing similar curriculum on paper that you are online, in most states that should still meet your goal and your requirement of equal access to all students. So step one, assess what you have. Step two, inquire with your families. Step three, many of you will need to go out and procure on an emergency basis additional resources. In California, and as may be the rest of the country, typically when you make purchases, you have to go through a fair and competitive process. Typically, there is an emergency exception, and many, if not all, counties and school districts are in the process of declaring an emergency if they have not already, and part of that emergency declaration can be the need to purchase emergency resources. Do not forget to have your business team review contracts that you are purchasing these emergency devices for things like data privacy, term length, termination, insurance, and we can get a little bit more into that. Um, another thing to evaluate as you go out making these purchases is if you work with an E-rate consultant or you wanna go on the E-rate webpage to get more information about whether or not E-rate funding is available for these purchases. Moving on to step four, at the same time you'll be developing your educational program. And I've already mentioned that this will account for the spectrum of del delivery methods and that that should be a flexible educational program. That the longer you are doing distance learning, uh, it is expected that school districts will be able to ramp up their efforts to deliver distance learning. Um, there are some unique you know, recommendations of how you can get uh, internet access, or some ideas, I should say, of how you can get internet access in the homes that don't otherwise have it. Um, you all may have heard of concepts like putting hotspots, Wi-Fi hotspots on school buses and parking them in neighborhoods. There's many organizations that are helping to deploy free Wi-Fi hotspots. Many internet providers are providing free service right now. So um, I know at the end of this, there are uh, resource pages and um, th that may have additional information for you. Step five, identify what curriculum you intend to utilize in order to deploy distance learning. Work with your curriculum and instruction team, but do not forget to review the contracts of these software companies um, with educational curriculum, because again, we need to make sure that the content meets standards and is safe by having all the correct data privacy tools in place. Um, we recommend that if your individual state isn't already requiring it, that you have your teams have some form of record keeping about tracking materials and instructional time, if it's, not if it's not already expressly required by your state. Step six, once you've identified your curriculum and your delivery method, don't forget to take into consideration how you may need to adapt your program in order to ensure access to your economically disadvantaged students, your English language learners, and your special education students. We have a wealth of additional information I know on our website and perhaps in the resources at the end specific to delivering instruction to these specific populations. Step seven, school districts will need to provide training to their staff on how to use these software platforms and devices to parents and to students to navigate these online learning tools. Do not uh, keep in mind that there may be collective bargaining implications with your staff and therefore please bring in your human resources or labor and employment administrators to navigate that process. Step eight, communic communicate clearly your plan, your distance learning plan to your community and your expectations. Step nine, 
Now we'll be at the point where we are deploying the resources, the devices, the hotspots, the cable cord. Um, first and foremost, work with your county health department to determine what safety measures are needed and expected, gloves, masks, Clorox wipes. Um, but you need to establish a process. So this may be recording the condition of the devices that are going out, the serial numbers, because at one point in time, you may need to be uh, having those all return to school. And um, many school districts are requiring a, an agreement on expectations of use or putting a policy in place for both staff and students. And those policies will govern a lot of the topics we'll cover today regarding expectations of use, notices about recording, FERPA compliance. Um, don't forget to evaluate your insurance coverage in case devices go missing or stolen. And finally, uh, make sure that your essential service workers includes maintaining IT support for staff and students. Uh, a final word of caution is there has been an increase in cyber attacks just in the past few weeks. So make sure your IT team is aware of that and can cont continue to provide a safe learning environment for your students. So with that, I will turn it back over to our team to get into our Q&A. Great, thanks Gretchen. Um, just before we go to question two, I just wanna remind everybody, we're not addressing questions about how to use specific prod products in a uh, you know, privacy protected way or questions about special ed in particular. Um, I know F3 Law would be happy to answer those questions offline um, and our, I'm sure our, our contact information will be there at the end. So. Question two, is online learning permissible under FERPA? All right, so let's talk about some considerations here. We have some clear answers, but a lot of the answers involve questions that the Department of Education hasn't necessarily provided clear answers to. And so I'm going to try and differentiate where I am sort of conducting um, where the law isn't as clear and where we do have clear answers. So first and foremost, what notice or consent is required before you deliver online instruction to students? So under FERPA, it doesn't really matter how you are delivering online instruction. The key is whether the tool aligns with FERPA's requirements or your state law's requirements or not. And if it doesn't align with those requirements, then consent must be provided before you turn over any student information to the provider of that tool. And so I'm gonna go into this a little bit more and talk about what FERPA requires here. So as many of you know, FERPA, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, prohibits schools from disclosing personally identifiable information from students' education records without first obtaining parental consent unless an exception applies. Most of the time in the online learning context, you're going to be using the school official exception in FERPA which allows schools to not only share information with your teachers, with parent volunteers and others, but also to use tools for online learning. However, the company or nonprofit, whatever tool you are using, whatever third party, um, in order to receive that personally identifiable information from students' education record, they have to be fulfilling these four things. So they have to be performing an institutional service or function that the school would otherwise use its own employees for. So you can think of this as sort of in an ideal world. If you had the money for it, you would hire staff to do all the things in your school. And so this is a pretty flexible requirement. Uh, so are, they are helping you conduct online learning. In that case, you fulfill this bullet. The third party you're turning over information to has to have a legitimate educational interest in the information. This means you're only turning over the information that they need to know to deliver the service to your students. The third element is that the third party has to be under the school's direct control 
in terms of how the third party will use the personally identifiable information. This is often where online tools fall short. Many of their terms of service allow online tools to do whatever they want with data, uh, to share it. Uh, some online tools use data um, provided by the school or by the students for targeted advertising or other things like that. If you're interested in what direct control means, you're not alone, everyone is, uh, there isn't a very clear answer from the Department of Education, but they do have a really helpful list in a resource that we can drop in chat on using online educational services. And it's a list of elements that help you determine whether uh, the vendor may or may not be in direct control. So it says things like, if the terms of service says they can share information with whoever they want, they're not. If they can um, change their terms of service substantially at any time, then they're not under the direct control, all of those things. And so whenever you're dealing with the direct control requirement, if the company or third party is not under the direct control here, you likely need to get consent from parents or students um, that are eligible to provide consent under FERPA. And then the other, the last element for the school official exception in FERPA is that the third party can only use education records or personally identifiable information for authorized purposes and cannot redisclose it. They can't reshare that information in any way without your consent. They can only use the information in furtherance of the original purpose that they can, that they received the information for. And again, this is something where if you're just signing up for a service, it's very likely that the service may say that they can share the information for other purposes. And in that case, again, you'd probably have to get consent to use that service with students. Skipped over slide there. Um, so again, what does FERPA require if this information is disclosed to a third party? The other elements here, um, a school official has to be described in your annual FERPA notice to parents. What does your school consider to be a school official? Many of your districts are probably operating uh, using the model uh, FERPA notice from the Department of Education. In that case, what your district or your school defines a school official as is probably very broad and encompasses this sort of situation where you are using online learning tools. If it doesn't though, you may need to send out a new FERPA notice in order to use this exception for distance learning. And again, the other elements here, direct control, can only use the information for the authorized purposes. This, I should say, can be a little bit broader. They can use it to, can use information to uh, improve the product, to fix the product, all of that's considered under the banner of authorized purposes. They're limited on what they can redisclose, and remember that parents have a right to access their students' education records. So as you're providing information to a third party and students may be generating information as they use that service, any of that information that fits under whether something is personally identifiable information in an education record, all of that has to be given back to parents if it's available. I know all of this is very confusing. Good news is, None of this is new. And so there are a lot of resources that we can provide uh, in response to questions after this. Feel free to email us, contact us. Uh, there are a lot of really detailed webinars about how to work with third parties in disclosing information to a third party that apply just the same in a distance learning situation as it does when you're holding in-person classes. I want to emphasize that there's also guidance from the Department of Education specifically about an online service provider in a distance learning situation. So this letter put out in, I believe, 2017 or early 2018 uh, was a response to a parental complaint. And these are the key points. 
parents cannot be required to waive their FERPA rights as a condition of enrolling or participating in an education program. This means that if you haven't done your due diligence to make sure that an app or software or website falls under the FERPA school official exception, you must get their consent and they don't have to give it to you. This is why it's much better to use a vetted app or service uh, that uh, someone in your district or others have found is compliant with FERPA and whatever state laws. Uh, emphasize, the letter also emphasized that again, schools should use the school official exception where they have to make sure that the vendor is under their direct control and is not resharing the data rather than consent for required apps and services being used in schools. And then review vendors' terms of service closely to ensure that direct control has been properly established. I know many of you also have questions about COPPA. This is not a law that applies to schools. And so generally, you don't have to worry about it. But many vendors may try and pass on their responsibilities under COPPA to you as a school or district. So COPPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, applies when children under 13 engage with many online learning tools. COPPA regulates companies and requires verifiable parental consent for the collection, use, or disclosure of PII from children. If COPPA is implicated, so if you are creating, you know, an online learning, using an online learning tool for those who are under 13, it is allowable for schools instead of parents to provide consent for the disclosure of personal information from children under the age of 13, but only if that third party will use student information solely for the benefit of the school, for an educational purpose, and not for any commercial purposes. If it goes over into that commercial purpose line, at that point you have to get parental consent, and again, parents do not have to give you that consent. The easy way to look at this is if you are fulfilling FERPA school official exception and you are using a tool under that exception, you're good under COPPA 90% of the time. And so as a school, go ahead and focus on that and don't worry about COPPA right now. However, if a vendor says, we need you to get consent because of our COPPA obligations, that's probably a red flag because they likely are doing something that isn't allowed under FERPA or COPPA without consent. Things like using third-party trackers for advertising or um, uh, selling information, sharing information with partners, other things like that. Um, and so be wary uh, of those requests and reach out to your legal counsel. Great, so before we go into the next question, just a reminder for my panelists, we're at 27 minutes past the hour. And so the next question is, can I use live video for distance learning? Can I record lessons? And I think we're gonna start with Gretchen. Um, well, Amelia, did you wanna jump in before I start? I see you have a slide up here. Yeah, uh, so just really quickly. Um, so would using video conferencing for online learning violate FERPA? Mm. Um, this is a question we've been asked a ton. So schools can use video conferencing tools that meet the school official exception discussed earlier. Generally tools that are developed for general audiences or workplaces were not designed, most likely, with student privacy laws in mind. So before engaging with any online platform, do your due diligence and ensure that appropriate privacy protections are in place. Consider tools developed for learning environments and tools pre-vetted and approved by your school or district. Okay, this is Gretchen. And given that we're halfway through the hour, I'm gonna move through some of this, my slides fairly quickly because these will be available to you in the future and we'll have follow-up webinars for additional questions. So one concept I wanted to address is this very popular uh, concept of posting pictures on social media or the internet of online classes. 
it is great what all the teachers are doing and how creative and innovative they are, but we have to respect student privacy. So there's two concepts that come into play here. Does the online video of classroom instruction contain a quote educational record um, that would be under FERPA, which would give them a privacy right and could not be shared publicly without their consent. And so when is an educational record created through online instruction? When it focuses on a particular student, um, when they are the focus of the video. So let's say for example, they're giving a book report that discloses personal information of one particular individual and could create an educational record. Therefore, you could not share it publicly, like on social media or the internet, without that student's consent. And if you all don't mind, I wanna skip over to, I'm gonna skip over to slide 17 because I think there's a, another concept here that goes hand in hand with this. So on one hand, we need to make sure they're not creating an educational record where we'd be sharing that publicly without their consent. But the other second concept that goes hand in hand here is, what about students who have opted out under FERPA from having their image shared? So all school districts throughout the country provide a FERPA notice at the beginning of the year. And that FERPA notice says, we can share your directory information, your name, your address, your photo, unless you opt out. It is important that school districts maintain a list of who has opted out. Think about why a student may have opted out of having their information shared. Sadly, many of the times it's because they may have a non-custodial parent who may be violent, maybe they're getting out of jail and their custodial parent does not want their identity or their location shared publicly. So it becomes a real safety issue. So it's important that if you, that you have a process in place that before any teacher would post images on the internet, that they double check that your district's opt out list. So as you develop your policy and your guidelines for online learning, the, I guess the takeaway here would be don't post your online classes on social media or um, on the internet without specific student consent and or checking that opt out list. And if you have students on the opt out list, don't do it at all. Hope that was clear. Yes, that was great, Gretchen, and one that unfortunately we've seen a lot of uh, those sorts of screenshots on social media. Um, I do want to emphasize that just because you can't post a uh, lesson publicly does not mean that you can't record it and share it with students later. So this is an area where the Department of Ed has not weighed in directly except in uh, their write-up to uh, regulations that were passed in 2008 and 2011 about how data can be shared within a class. So FERPA does not allow students or their parents to opt out of data uh, covered by FERPA that is being shared for pedagogical purposes. Again, not an explicit exception to FERPA, so tread carefully here. When there is an in-person class, there is sharing of personally identifiable information that is part of education records all the time, from calling on a student and therefore using their name, to knowing which students are in which classes, to being able to have students participate in a group project for which they receive a collective grade. The key for applying this is to ask how easy it is to separate out a student's education record from whatever you are posting for other students to watch from that video, whatever it is. If you can cut a student giving a book report from their recording easily, and that wasn't part of the key lesson, so there wasn't a pedagogical value in that presentation, then you should not post that part of the lesson recording that is about that particular student. However, due diligence must be exercised to guarantee as much as practicable that the recording is only accessible to students in that class. So post it on your learning management system, post it um, somewhere behind a strong password with strong security. You must <clears throat> be very careful there um, because this is something allowed under FERPA, but it only counts for those students 
in that class. Um, some related tips, have a policy regarding what educators are allowed to do or not do when it comes to using video as students are recording lessons. You may want to check your acceptable use policies for language that covers prohibiting students from taking and sharing recording of other students and teachers. If a, the student part of whatever that recording is isn't necessary, if it's not an interactive lesson, encourage teachers to only record and share the presentation part of the lesson and ensure that any settings for the recording only show the presentation, not the participant videos or names or a recording of any chat box or answers. Ensure that any tool used has appropriate data retention policies in place and sharing and that you yourself have specific retention and deletion policies for any videos that you're posting for later viewing. Consider setting some baseline rules of engagement for teachers and students using these platforms and be transparent and let students know when they are being recorded, uh, how long the recording will be stored, who has access to it, and think about allowing students to opt out of attending a live recording. So Amelia, I believe that answers Rob Lander's question about uh, Google Classroom. You can post things into a secure location, um, recordings into a secure location. Absolutely, but definitely wanna emphasize that you wanna make sure that students are also aware that they shouldn't reshare this, that they shouldn't take screenshots of their fellow students uh, in a class and post them elsewhere. So consider having students sign something that says they acknowledge that they can't, you know, share information from those recorded lessons if you are going to provide them. I want to point you all to a fabulous resource that just came out from the Consortium for School Networking on video conferencing tools, privacy considerations. It is phenomenal. I'm not going to go through these, uh, but again, the slides will be available later in that full discussion of privacy considerations for video conferencing tools is available freely online. So Gretchen, turning it back to you now. Sure, this is a pretty uh, straightforward question and answer, I believe. The question has come up from students and parents, is video conferencing directly into a student's home a violation of their privacy right under FERPA? And last week on March 23rd, the U.S. Department of Ed issued a notice and several resources clarifying that in fact that is not a violation to their privacy, just as a parent or volunteer may observe in a classroom, they also would have the same rights to observe or uh, volunteer in a virtual classroom. Therefore, it's not a violation of their FERPA. They did say, however, though, that it may be a local school decision as to whether or not um, they want to, uh, it wouldn't violate their rights, but you may have some local control on what your recommendations are for teachers as to how they would like your classroom set up and disturbances and um, a quiet setting for everyone. But they specifically said FERPA neither requires nor prohibits individuals from observing a classroom. So again, recording. Can you record lessons or meetings? We've gotten a lot of questions about meetings, counseling sessions with students uh, be recorded to review for accountability purposes later or in case there are later accusations of misconduct. Probably yes, check your state law here. There may be very specific laws that apply. Talk to your district council uh, and, and ensure that um, you are allowed to do this. But just speaking about FERPA, you can record it, but you cannot share it unless a FERPA exception applies. As discussed, many of these lessons or meetings likely include personally identifiable information from an education record and therefore cannot be shared without consent or unless a FERPA exception applies. Just creating and storing the recording as a school or as an employee acting on behalf of the school is fine. And note that these recordings would likely be subject to FERPA access rights. 
aka you'll have to give parents access if they request it as part of the education record. As a tip, store these recordings centrally. You really don't want you know, the counseling session or something that uh, your school counselor or others are holding digitally with students on their, you know, potentially personal devices um, and ensure that they are deleted in a timely manner. As I noted, it could be a security risk for individual staff to each have these recordings stored separately on their computers or in their accounts. Gretchen, anything to add here? Yes, I would be happy to. Um, I do know that we have a number of California attendees, so I would like to share the law in California briefly. W many states have eavesdropping laws that basically state you cannot record somebody without their notice if they would have a reasonable expectation of privacy. In California, it has been determined in law that students don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy in the classroom. And so if you record students in the classroom, typically you don't have to give any notice before you record them. Now, it's an interesting question whether there should be heightened reasonable expectation of privacy in one's home. And erring on the side of caution, we are recommending that when you go record your lessons, that notice is provided, that they are being recorded. Um, that can either be done verbally or um, in a pop-up screen. Um, it's understandable why we're going to want to record lessons so you can deliver them in the future to students who didn't attend. Uh, but I definitely think uh, it's a good practice tip to go ahead and provide that notice. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Gretchen. Again, passing to you. Okay. Well, this one will be pretty brief, but it's very serious. Uh, sadly, there's already been reports of a, a sharp uptick and of abuse and neglect in the home very stressful time for everybody. Everybody's hold up together. And again, check your state law. But in almost every state, teachers are mandated reporters of abuse and neglect, regardless of where they see it. So it's not just in the classroom. If you're communicating with students online and a teacher reasonably suspects abuse and neglect, it is to be reported to Child Protective Services, or law enforcement. So I just wanted to make that important reminder. So if you're a school administrator and you're ramping up your distance learning for your staff, this would be a great practice tip to include in your training for staff or your guidelines for staff. Okay, we are at 41 minutes past the hour. Um, next question, what are teachers' responsibilities regarding student misconduct online? Gretchen? So again, uh, as Amelia talked previously about FERPA, the rules haven't changed all that much. Your code of conduct, your responsible use policy is going to apply at home just in the way it would at school. Your methods of disciplining may have to change. You may not be able to suspend somebody when they're already at home. And my uh, recommendation is to review your acceptable use policy, your code of conduct, and update it if it doesn't contemplate misconduct at home. I know we're not going to get into the weeds of the technical side of things, but there are resources for how you can set your online platform settings to minimize misconduct. And again, school districts, that's a way you can provide tools to your staff or requirements for your staff that settings be required for online instruction to minimize disruption. Another tip I want to share, um, and careful how you communicate this to your community because it could sound alarming, but when, when devices are not being used for instruction, remind staff and students to cover their cameras, even if it's with a piece of tape. Um, so again, you might want to be careful in how you deliver that message, but it is a great uh, responsible use tip, whether you're in the educational setting or not. Gretchen, there's a, a question uh, about content filters. Michelle's content filter is only on campus, so is she required to purchase content filtering for the devices that they're sending home? Let's go ahead and hold that question for the moment once we get into the SIPA uh, filtering and monitoring conversation, I think. Sounds good. Stay tuned. Okay. Thank you, Andrea. 
Okay, can a teacher sell their online lesson plan? So full disclosure, I'm not an intellectual property attorney. However, it's my understanding that lesson plans are works for hire. Teachers develop lesson plans for their employer, the district, and the district typically owns those lesson plans. Accordingly, teachers should not be sharing them publicly and selling them online without the consent of their employer. Many districts may or may not care that teachers wanna go ahead and sell their lesson plan, but um, our recommendation for staff would be not to do that without permission. Okay, Amelia, what obligations do schools have under SIPA to filter and monitor school-owned devices or accounts when students are at home? So this is an incredibly difficult issue, but the good news is I have somewhat of a clear answer. Uh, so as many of you may know, if you take E-Rate funding, then you're required to comply with the Children's Internet Protection Act. And SIPA requires that schools create internet safety policies that have exactly what it says on this slide, a technology protection measure that protects against internet access by both adults and minors to visual depictions that are obscene, child pornography, or with respect to use of the computers by minors harmful to minors. The school must enforce the operation of the technology protection measure during its use of its computers with internet access and this internet safety policy must also include monitoring the online activities of minors. This is the only guidance we have on what you're required to do. There is good and bad news here. Uh, and I should also note this was last updated in 2003. So thank you, FCC. Uh, so the good news with this is don't change the policies you already have. <laughs> um, if you were filtering or monitoring, start there. Think about um, what you were already doing to filter or monitor uh, your school-owned devices or student accounts. And so with that in mind, um, this is obviously going to be a little different because students are working from home. So start, as I said, with your existing internet safety policies, your filtering and monitoring, and model the emergency response here after that default policy. Schools across the nation comply with SIPA in a variety of ways, and there is not a right answer here. So what your school chooses to do here should be fine. This can involve full filtering, this can involve full monitoring. This can include limited filtering or limited monitoring and arguably legally no filtering and monitoring while the devices are off campus. In my opinion, the language is ambiguous enough that any approach here is going to be acceptable. Um, definitely do consider limiting any monitoring that you are doing to certain hours of the day Consider engaging with your school community for feedback. Would parents prefer that you turn off monitoring during this time so they can monitor their own children? Um, do they find it creepy that you are able to monitor? Um, and also consider equity issues that may result from excessive monitoring. We're dealing with some students that don't have alternative devices. And we're living in a time where those devices may be their only lifeline to family, to friends, et cetera. And so maybe monitoring everything is not going to be appropriate when students who can afford an, another device are doing perhaps the same things that other students are doing, but just so happen to be able to afford the technology so the school won't know about it. Gretchen, speaking practically as someone who's advising schools on all these issues, uh, what do you have to add here? So I, what I think of is practically what is the risk if your monitoring and filtering is not as robust as it normally would be on campus. The risk is that your federal E-rate funds include a requirement that you comply with SIPA. So should the district be audited 
they would evaluate what sort of monitoring and filtering you have in place. Um, I don't want to say don't comply with the law, but given the circumstances, I would anticipate that they'd be somewhat flexible if districts can demonstrate they are making their best effort or trying to substantially comply with the requirements to monitor and filter under those circumstances. I also want to mention that on the other side of, uh, as you're weighing your options about filtering and monitoring, also thinking about the fact that there may be some strange Fourth Amendment issues here on how you're allowed to search students. Uh, obviously, the lines between home and school are blurring. And so in addition to whatever the policies are, there may be some weird nuances about what you're doing now that everyone's working from home. There may be case law in your state about how far you can go in searching a student uh, when they are off campus or searching their online accounts when they're off campus. Other states have limitations on whether you're allowed to access student uh, accounts, which could be read to be broad enough that uh, monitoring any access of personal accounts, even on a school-owned device, could get very tricky if you don't have clear policies and clear notice that if they visit that site, they're being monitored. So be really careful here uh, and know that there is you know, potential liability on either side for schools. And so again, I, I would just encourage folks to go back to your community and see what parents think is appropriate in this situation where people are working from home. Okay, that we're gonna is, go, sorry, go ahead, Andrea. Sorry, I was just gonna say, we're, we're gonna go through a couple of resource pages here. If you have not had your question answered, now is the time to put it in the question and answer box. Um, and there is one out there that we'll get to in just a second. Amelia? Perfect. Uh, I just wanted to point out FPF uh, has been putting out a ton of resources here. We have um, specifically a list of resources on student privacy uh, during this pandemic, both some resources created specifically uh, on this topic, as well as some of those resources I mentioned earlier about you know, vetting online learning products generally that apply equally here, as well as uh, folks who vet apps for youth, like Common Sense Media and others that we're linking to in those resources. Um, so continue to visit uh, FERPASHERPA.org. Feel free to subscribe to FPF's monthly student privacy newsletter and for uh, local education agency, state education agency staff, um, or anyone working on behalf of a school who's interested in learning more about student privacy. We have a free working group once a month uh, and, and would love to have you join that and learn more about uh, what are the requirements of student privacy, not only in this emergency, but moving forward. There are also some great resources uh, from Sight and F3 Law. I'll let you guys talk about that. <laughs> Yeah, we all have our, our pages, right? Um, and what we've been doing here at SITE is really just collecting um, information from our members, from vendors. We, uh, we sent a, a vendor-wide email out to those who are, are, are part of our community. Number one, asking them to halt any sales calls. And number two, if they were providing any special um, deals or, or special things for schools during this time, to send them to us. And so our page has um, information that are, you know, low level information from members, but also um, federal, federal information and vendor information. Gretchen? And, uh, sure, this is Gretchen. On F3 Law website for COVID specifically, what we have done, as I mentioned, we're an education law firm. We are creating resources in response to school district questions. And while I chair our practice dedicated to education technology, I have colleagues that specialize in special education, colleagues that are labor negotiators and all of the uh, labor and employment implications. Um, we have, there are several resources 
intended to be very practical guidance and short and efficient to help you all navigate this while you're under an ex extreme pressure. We also have guidance regarding open meetings and how those can be transitioned to virtual meetings. So um, we hope that you, we, you find this helpful. And if there's additional guidance that you all want, please do not hesitate to reach out. We are here to help you through this challenging time. And here are several resources that we have found useful over the past several weeks. So the Department of Education has put out official guidance on FERPA and virtual learning with some links to previous resources as well as a webinar and the recording of that webinar. They've also put out an FAQ on how you are allowed to share student health information and disclose that if a student or educator in your community uh, ends up um, getting the virus. So highly recommend checking that out. Uh, two of the most useful resources we've seen released so far come from the Utah State Board of Education and from COSIN, as I had mentioned earlier. Definitely check those out. And again, all of these slides uh, and the recording will be made available to you. So you'll be able to check out all of these resources uh, in the email after the presentation. Great, so we do have a couple of questions here. Um, Robert's question, is there an age limit on webcams being on? I've heard mixed messages that Google Meet, especially video, should not be used for students under 13. Amelia, I believe this is a question related to COPPA, which you covered previously. Do you want to respond? Sure, so it doesn't necessarily matter that, um, there isn't a difference under COPPA about what kind of data is being collected from kids under 13. So video, photo, name, questions, things they type in a chat box. Um, so at least under that law, uh, the only thing you have to keep in mind again is are you in using that video of a student, are you in compliance with the school official exception of FERPA? And if you are, you're fine having that video. If you're not, then you have to get consent for that video um, to be used. You have to get parents to sign on to say, I am okay with you disclosing this data to Google Meet or Zoom or whatever else. I am not familiar uh, in particular with this, and so if anyone uh, in chat is on the technology side and has an answer here, I know that Google, uh, that G Suite for Education has made specific changes. Aha, we have an answer from the fabulous Jim Siegel. Um, so uh, Google Meet is now part of G Suite for Education's core services and is covered under Google's education privacy notice and has the same privacy as every other part of the core much of the security and privacy of G Suite for Education, and I will add to that, it's compliance with perhaps your unique state student privacy law requirements, as well as any requirements regarding uh, video recordings. Um, all of that depends on how the administrator configures the tools. Uh, Google has provided guidance for how to set up Meet for Use in Distance Learning, and the link to that is in the chat. This is Gretchen. I've also uh, spoken with, and actually I think Site has as well. Um, we've heard from Google this week that they are rapidly um, creating updates to address some of the more challenging and disruptive features of Google Meet and that they anticipate those will be implemented and rolled out next week. Yes, that's what we've heard. Um, okay, this, this question has to do with records retention. Is there some sort of record retention rule that is part of the E-rate requirements that would require retention of any recordings that are made? I'm not So sure. the only information uh, under E-rate, which is really under the Children's Internet Protection Act, is the language I had on that slide. That is the only guidance we have about the filtering and monitoring. 
And so there is nothing under that that would require retention. But I know there are some states that under their general record retention requirements for schools or for government entities require that any recordings made with personal information be retained for a certain amount of time. So look at your state's laws there. Uh, Gretchen, can you speak to California on this? Um, in California, it's a little unclear right now what the record keeping expectations are during distance learning. So we have a general recommendation that districts track instructional minutes and curriculum being implemented, where we foresee this becoming a big issue, and, and really the real basis for our recommendation is for special education students who are entitled to a free and appropriate education and may come back at a later date and claim that maybe perhaps they weren't denied services that they were entitled to during this time. And so it would be very helpful if the district maintains records of what services were being delivered. So Sherry is looking for a clarification. Are you saying there is no age restriction with webcams being, being available to students under 13? Again, there may be something under your state law. So in particular, you may have a state law, a district policy, something else that has limited uh, how educators and students are able to communicate with each other, uh, which may include a restriction on video. However, under privacy laws specifically, there is not an age restriction related to webcams being available to students under 13. Instead, the question that you should look at, just as with any other data uh, being shown on a third party platform or being turned over to a third party platform, is whether or not uh, the third party uh, who, you know, if I was showing my video right now, uh, would Zoom, is Zoom in compliance with FERPA's requirements? regarding the school official exception. Uh, is Zoom, in this case, um, compliant? If it is not, then you have to get consent from parents before using a webcam with a student under 13. If it is in compliance with FERPA's school official exception, so the school is in direct control of the information, it's only being used for an education purpose, all of that, in that case, um, you would not need to get parental consent so long as that information, again, continues to be shared or uh, stored or used in compliance with FERPA's school official exception. Great. So I, I know we're at our time. Do you guys want to continue? I, have, I do have a couple more questions. Happy to do just a couple if anyone has to hop off. A reminder that we'll send uh, the recording uh, and the slides. Um, but happy to take a couple more questions, Gretchen, if you have time. Yes, and I, before we do close, I did have a couple closing tips, if that would, if there was time for that. Okay. Um, I think I might just have one more. Uh, we, uh, in the chat, um, Amy says, we have parents wanting to conduct instructional video sessions with small groups of students. Thoughts or violation considerations seems potentially dangerous. Gretchen, do you want to start here? Um, I, 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 have, I do not have much objection to small groups of students. One-on-one -on -one students, I could see where that could be uh, a little bit more potentially dangerous. But small group settings, um, you know, I don't see a FERPA violation there. And I don't have any objection to that. But I'd be curious to see what you have to say, Amelia. Yeah, um, this is again something where, as Gretchen said, one-on-one -on -one, you might have issues with, you know, potential improper behavior alleged later on or something where you may want to uh, have some sort of policy in place, uh, perhaps record it, various things like that. Um, but when it's a small group of students and the educator, I can't think of a particular issue. Again, it's about the underlying platform that is being used. Because just by being on video, all of us being on video with Zoom right now, you're turning over information whether you know it or not. And so the underlying question is whether the platform that you're using uh, is, operates, has terms of service and a privacy policy or a contract with your school 
that is in compliance and allows your school to be in compliance with FERPA and your state student privacy laws. If it does not uh, have terms of service, a privacy policy or a contract that's in compliance, then you have a problem and you need to get consent from parents. If it is in compliance, then you can operate under FERPA's school official exception. Okay, great. Um, Alex is asking, should we re recommend um, not using Zoom, but using Google Meet? And I know that we said at the beginning, we were not going to uh, be, you know, recommending one product over the other. I personally know of districts using both, both of those um, successfully. And as Gretchen mentioned, Google is making changes to Meet uh, to make it more private and more secure. So I think you just need to really you know do the research and make the decision um enoch was was uh cautioning about the free version of zoom and and that's definitely something you want to look at don't just don't just jump on a free version of something make sure that you've got your privacy policies and your and your um cybersecurity all uh you know that you're able to manage that before you jump on a free product i'll emphasize with that also um I believe it's easier for an individual educator to sign up for account for G Suite for Education. Um, and uh, as previously mentioned, Google Meet has now been made part of the core service products uh, where it complies, uh, depending on how you set the administrative settings with FERPA school official exception, potentially with state student privacy laws. So if your school does not have a centralized approach, maybe slightly better um, than using Zoom for Education at the moment, um, because as of right now, which is last time I went on the web page, um, I think the school itself has to set up Zoom for Education versus an individual educator. Um, and so just signing up for the retail version of that or any product um, uh, likely means you either need consent before you turn over any information, uh, from parents or you need um, you need to have a contract or some other agreement with the company. Right. Uh, last, last question here. Lefty is asking, is it okay to allow access for students to be able to communicate with one another using Google Hangouts or Meet or et cetera um, if the tools are provided by the district? This may include video as well as chat. Gretchen, do you want to start here? Sure. This is a tough one that we received. I keep analogizing this to the school environment. Would you allow students to get in small groups and work in homework together? Sure. Is the district going to be able to monitor and supervise that? Maybe. So again, you know, if they're using a district platform, a district device, there may be some monitoring and supervision implications and to again, maybe provide notification through a pop-up or a banner that utilization of these school resources and software platforms may be subject to recording. And, and again, reminders that um, anytime they're engaging in school work, that they have to abide by the school's code of conduct and responsible use policy. I, I do have concerns, again, Amelia brought this up earlier, about reasonable expectations of privacy and potential Fourth Amendment implications if students think they are not being monitored. So that's, again, why I think we need to be very clear when um, to parents as well as students when content's being recorded, when it is being uh, monitored and filtered. Everything Gretchen said is right on the ball. I just want to add there, you're going to have some weird situations as students are at home where they may have a personal uh, Google account or Microsoft account, whatever it, it may be, where they're both logged into their school account and their personal account on the same device and may accidentally you know, be chatting or other things um, where they think they're on their personal account and are actually on their school account you may run into more of those situations now uh, as these lines blur. And, and so just be aware that you could be unintentionally collecting some inappropriate <laughs> conduct and the student doesn't know about it and it could get pretty messy pretty fast. Um, 
also just consider uh, consider the liability on the other side as well as students uh, may be thinking, um, maybe being cyberbullied or other things, how are you going to handle that in a virtual environment? Again, you probably already had policies here. What are those policies? Start thinking now about the way that students may be using chat, may be using school accounts, may be using school devices, and how you're gonna deal with those situations moving forward. Great, thank you very much. Um, I think that's it. Amelia, I mean, uh, Andrew, this is Gretchen. Do you mind if I take a, a quick minute to uh, share some real practical takeaway wrap up tips? Absolutely. I, I think everyone recognizes this is overwhelming for school districts, but also for your staff and your families. And so what, what I would like to see school districts do is create ways to deliver really clear and direct communication. And I think a preliminary step that we've vetted in detail here today is let's evaluate what online learning platform you're going to utilize and really evaluate what safety measures there are, data privacy measures, and make sure that your platform at the outset, you've done what you can to provide a safe school environment for online instruction. Communicate to your staff what settings you expect from them what type of notices they need to be providing when there's recordings. Uh, as we talked about, make sure you have a protocol in place for students who opt out, have opted out of having their images shared publicly, because again, that's a real safety issue. Reminders about mandated reporting, um, reminders about copyright. So that's just a few of the topics we've touched on today, but I just really wanted to make sure the idea here is Let's evaluate what platform you're using for data privacy and communicate clearly to your staff how they can create a safe school environment for online instruction. Thank you, Gretchen. Um, and I want to thank Amelia again, Director of Youth and Education Privacy for Future of Privacy Forum. Gretchen is with the Fagan, Friedman and Full Frost Law Firm here in California. She's the co-chair of their eMatters team and a partner with the law firm. And I'm um, Andrea Bennett, uh, Executive Director for SITE. And I want to thank everybody who, who joined us today. Uh, they, they re again, the recording will be sent out. Uh, we'll probably have it posted on our respective websites as well. So thanks, everyone. Anything, any parting shots, Amelia? Only thing I'll say is feel free to email uh, me at avance at fpf.org if you have any questions. And then Gretchen, if anyone has questions for you, how would you like them to contact you? Um, I can be found at G Shipley, G S H I P L E Y, at f3law.com. Wonderful. I'll put that on the chat. Perfect. And we'll keep the window open for a moment so you can pull any resources you'd like out of chat. And if people have questions about site or about sites, great resources, Andrea, uh, who should they reach out to? Perfect, we got the email address for Andrea put in chat, andrea.bennett yep. at site.org. Thank you all so much for attending. We really appreciate it. And thank you all for doing so much to take care of your students' privacy and education in these crazy times. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.